finishing this entire book, and I'm really tempted to pull a book out of Luther's uh, a page out of Luther's book. Do you remember the first sermon in Galatians when we said that Martin Luther, the reformer, loved this book so much, he lectured on it and preached uh, for months and months on end to his congregation in Germany. And when they finished the uh, chapter six, the next week he came and opened up and said, open up your Bible, we're going to be preaching through the book of Galatians chapter one, verse one. And he did it again. And I'm so tempted because I've loved the book of Galatians, not only for the truth that's in it and how invigorating it is to study it week by week and then preach it to you, but also how many people, uh, dozens, have just uh, taken me aside and wanted to say something about the, the liberation of soul that's come uh, from the, in a life of, uh, uh, fr from sin towards freedom, from guilt towards liberation and a sense of forgiveness in Christ, uh, those who are strapped and trapped under legalism, feeling the liberty and freedom that Christ brings them, not even because I'm preaching about all of their specific situations every week, but because this is what God does when we preach, proclaim, and love to hear and receive with meekness the word of Jesus Christ in the gospel. The Spirit takes it and blesses it to our benefit. It's been such a great joy, but I suppose we better get into chapter 5 tonight. We're going to be in verse 16, so I ask you to look there. Chapter 5 is... At the, well, the, numerically, in the second half of Galatians, very good. But thematically and structurally, basically at chapter 5, verse 7, you could look there, 5, verse 7, uh, sorry, 5, verse 6, Paul really took a right-angle turn, a 90-degree turn. The whole of chapter, basically, 1 through uh, the 4, and even the beginning of 5, has been him arguing for his apostolic authority so that he can, he can rebuke the false teachers and uh, establish the gospel. And then he was theologically using the Old Testament to argue for the fact that the gospel of Jesus Christ grants us forgiveness without any deeds that we have to do. No religious acts and no religious deeds are required. No lawful obedience is required for you to receive the free gift of grace in Jesus Christ. God loves giving it out as a gift. That was his argumentation up and his, on our part. If you ask, well, what do we do? Well, what's our part? What do we bring to the table? Of course, the answer is just nothing, nothing at all. All you have to do is be willing to bring nothing to the table and receive the free gift. And that willingness, Paul calls faith. Faith is not actually something we work up in ourselves to trust God enough that he gets the motivation and the spiritual vibe to then do something, as you might think listening to some preachers these days. Faith, 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 something you, you, you do, and then when God feels really trusted, he'll come out, come out to bat for you. No, faith is that simple, open hand receiving the gift of Christ. Faith is simply leaning backwards into the benefits of Jesus that are held out for you in and through his cross and in his resurrection. Faith is a passive thing. It is not a work. But faith, Paul has been saying all through chapter 1 through 4 and chapter 5, uh, Paul has been saying that faith alone justifies you before God. Faith alone engrafts you into God's family. Faith alone receives the Spirit. Faith alone fulfills the law because in faith you receive Jesus who fulfilled the law for you. Faith alone is all that is required. And faith does nothing, it just trusts. And then in chapter 5 verse 6, he throws on the handbrake, does a Vin Diesel turn the wheel, and then heads in another direction and tells us that this faith, which does no work, is a very active, working faith. This faith, which in the first place does nothing in receiving the salvation of Jesus, then, once it has received Jesus, is a very active, laborious, exerting, working faith. And if you get those two orders mixed up, I will work, I will do, my faith will be active, then Jesus will give me salvation. You have no salvation, you have no Jesus, you are condemned. But if we receive Jesus by faith and faith alone, then verse 6 of chapter 5 tells us that we will then live out, this faith will become so active in us that it produces love. So look at what the, the, the way that Paul says it in chapter 5 verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision counts for anything. This has been the argument of the heretics in Galatia. You've got to get circumcised and then follow Moses' law and then you'll be in the kingdom. And Paul says, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. Nothing 
in you. Nothing about you. Nothing you've done, nothing you've not done. Nothing you've said or agreed to, nothing you've never done or agreed to. Nothing about you whatsoever. As soon as you think of a condition that gives you Jesus, you're wrong. Nothing, nothing at all, at all, at all, ever, ever nothing but faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. The nothing but faith is basically the first half of the book, and the faith working through love is now basically the rest of chapter 5 and 6. So we've been spending all this time asking, how are we saved? How are we justified? How are we adopted? And it's all been about faith alone receiving Christ. And then we ask the question, well, how do we live? What do we do? How do we obey? How do we glorify God in our life? How do we obey God's law? How do we live in the way we're supposed to and love one another? And Paul says, ah, yes, that same faith starts working through loving kindness, through love, he says in verse 6. So we're down to verse 16 now, and we find ourselves in tonight's passage. Paul says this, I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Let me read that again because it's amazing. It's not actually a command. It's just telling you something true. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But... If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. May God bless his own word in our midst this evening. Tonight's consideration is the preeminence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. The preeminence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. Now, some of you have come from Pentecostal backgrounds, and you came to a Calvinist church, and you didn't think we believed in the Holy Spirit. Well, welcome. Here we are. We're about to study what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Because the Holy Spirit is primary. We're using the language of preeminence. He is absolutely necessary. Not a helpful add-on. He's not a cherry on top. He's not for those extra sanctified or those Christians who want to be extra sanctified. The Holy Spirit is the only way any Christian ever lives the Christian life. The Holy Spirit is, in fact, at work in us, bringing about the Christian life at the very first moments and at every moment of the Christian life. So if we think through the themes and the commands and the necessities of everything Paul's taught to us in Galatians, we see that on on the experiential end, the Spirit is at the base of all of them. We see that on the objective end, Jesus accomplished everything. But on our end, on the experiential end, whereby we actually partake into these benefits of Christ, it was always, at the very root of it, the Holy Spirit doing something in us. So, let me give you some examples. How is it that we have come to recognize that we are condemned by the law and in need of a Savior? The Holy Spirit working in your heart. How is it that we produce a faith which believes and embraces Christ. The Spirit works that faith in you. How do we stand firm against legalist enslavers like the Galatian heretics? By the Holy Spirit. How do we preserve in Christ by faith all the way to the end of our lives? It is by the Holy Spirit. How do we enjoy our freedoms in Jesus without descending into license and sin? By the Holy Spirit. How do we outwork our faith in love towards others? By the Holy Spirit. How do we serve each other? By the Holy Spirit. How do we fulfill the law in love, like last week said? By the Holy Spirit. How do we avoid legalistic control and biting of one another? By the Holy Spirit. And how do we put to death the fruit of the flesh that grows naturally within us? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is preeminent in the Christian life. You have no Christian life if the Spirit is not present. You can do nothing towards the Christian life if the Spirit is not present, but He is for all those who are truly sons of God. The the, the contradiction, not in Paul's language, but what Paul is contradicting in what he's saying, the thing that he is juxtaposing and contrasting with is the idea of the Galatian heretics that held that the way that you live unto God 
And the way that you obey and the way that you produce what is pleasing to God is through two very important things that Paul has had a lot to talk about. Through the flesh and through the law. How do you get better? By strenuous effort of your flesh. And what is the guardrails and the guide rails towards doing that? What's the ladder that you climb to increase holiness? The law of Moses. Your flesh plus the law of Moses equals a godly life. Not only as Paul said, theologically, that's not what God's will for us is in the new covenant. Not only that, but also every honest person that's ever tried their hardest to obey the law knows you don't end up more holy. You end up more frustrated. You end up more aware of your sin. You end up more angry at the pent-up guilt that you have. You sear your conscience to try and get over it. And looky-do, the next morning you're back into sin deeper than you were the day before. Some of you, this is your whole experience. You thought it was just you. I thought I was doing this whole Christianity thing right. It's just complete garbage and I'll be leaving as soon as my parents get their thumb off my neck. You know, I thought this is just how it is. Isn't this everybody? Are they not all just faking it like I am, that we try so hard to obey, feel guilty and terrible, keep on doing sinful things in the caverns of our souls and our bedrooms, and then, and then we die, or we just apostatize and leave the church once we get to university? Isn't that it? And you need to realize you have not been living the Christian life. You've not even tasted of the goodness of the Christian life because you haven't tasted of the mercy and grace of Jesus at all. You need to first receive the forgiving grace of God and then the Holy Spirit comes to you and completely changes your experience. If you've not experienced this, this is the ramblings of a madman. It's unprovable and it's it's, it's subjective in the sense that I can't show it to you in a Petri dish. But I'm telling you, a miracle has occurred in my life and dozens of us around here and it is a miracle alone that we are speaking of when we talk about the Christian experience called life. Something supernatural, something out of this world, and something spiritual and miraculous happens to people born out of the dirt and makes them have within themselves, by God's grace, a portion of the life and power of God himself. That thing is called a Christian. Something formed out of dirt, marred in sin, washed clean, spirit indwells and gives life, that is called a Christian. And if you've never experienced it, then that is your most pressing need. So the Holy Spirit is at the root of every part of our obedience to Jesus in the Christian life, not the law of Moses, and not your own flesh. In fact, Paul's going to show us in this passage, your own flesh is precisely the problem. The fruit of the flesh is not good. The fruit of your flesh, the only thing your own flesh can ever produce is sin. You would see that listed for us in verse 19 through to verse uh, uh, 21, except we're not going to do those passages this week. We're going to do them next week, give it their own, their own portion, the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. But Paul's point is, the flesh doesn't produce good. It produces the very thing that the Holy Spirit has sent to kill and fight. We need some basis and basic theology of the Holy Spirit before we go further. Some of us might be new to the faith. Welcome to the family of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this is your church and you worship and serve God with us here. Some of you are maybe new from bad sections or or we could say cults, but let's just say groups within Christianity where this has just been a huge area of confusion for you or some of us just need to brush up on it again. The Holy Spirit is a divine person. There is only three divine persons, though there is only one God. There is only three divine persons, not many, not a play Roma, not a a vast multitude of gods. You don't get to become a divine purpose person. I mean, there is only three divine persons, and they are all eternal and equally eternal as one another. These three persons, which we call the Trinity, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, as far as their nature goes, their essence the what of God, what is each of them, they are the exact thing, exact same thing, and of one substance. Not that they're made up of a substance, they are immaterial. In that sense, they are all spirit, without physical body. But in the sense of the, uh, the, the, the categories and the philosophical understandings of existence, their being 
Their being is one and the same. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equally God, equally majestic, equally glorious, equally wise, equally eternal, and equally infinite. They are God, each one of them. However, by, uh, it's the same in one nature, but they are distinct in their persons. And let me say this, the only difference between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is not a power upage on the Father or not a, 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 not a physical difference in the Spirit since they are none of them physical. The only difference and distinction between the Father, Son, and the Spirit is their correlations to one another. The only thing that makes them different, persons, is that they relate to each other from all eternity in the sense as Father to Son and Father to Spirit, Son to Father and Son to Spirit, and spirit to father and son. The only distinction between them is not power, is not personality, is not, is not divinity. The only difference is their relations to each other, which they from all of eternity have existed in. So one God, three persons. One existence, one essence, one substance, three subsistences or personas if you're a nerd and you like Latin and high high-level theology. Now, we must say this, since he is a person, the Holy Spirit is not an object, he is not merely a force, he must therefore never be referred to as an it. The Holy Spirit, it, it really convicted me this morning, I sometimes hear people say, well, he's about to do it again, because he's sick of you calling him a thing. He's not an it, he's not an object, he is a person, and he ought to be worshipped alongside Father and Son, he ought to be glorified alongside Father and Son. He is an eternal, divine person. We must say this. Of the Old Testament, you will read less about the Holy Spirit there. You will read less about the Holy Spirit in terms of theology and application and whatnot in the Old Testament. But that does not mean that he, first of all, did not exist. Like some modalists or manifestationists might say that... The Old Testament was the Father. There's just one God, one person. He just wears different hats and masks throughout history. He used to be the Father when he was in the person of Jesus. He was, he was putting on the mask of the Son. And then when Jesus went back up to heaven, he took off the mask. And now he presences himself as the Holy Spirit. But they are, no, no, they are not coexistent and co-eternal. We don't believe that. That's modalism, heresy. One of the oldest heresies the church has, in fact, ever fought. Go read a creed for once in your life. But... Jesus is not a mode of God, not a manifestation of the Father. He is the incarnation of the eternal divine Son. He was only manifest in the flesh, as Galatians 4 told us, at the fullness of time. His incarnation occurred at a very particular time, around about 0 to 5 AD on our timeline. Jesus, however, we know, in the divine person of the Son, pre-existed his incarnation. So also the Holy Spirit pre-existed the new covenant. He did not get born. He was not created. He was not coming, popping into existence after the Jesus' work on the cross or anything like that. He has always existed. He has eternally existed. He was active in the Old Testament at creation. He was active in the Old Testament in mediation and religious works. He was especially active in anointing certain people like kings or judges or prophets or priests. He would come upon them and work in them and work through them in magnificent ways, but less so on everybody. He would mostly work in a, in a focused and limited sense on one person or, or particular people. And sometimes he would be seen as coming upon them in power and then leaving. Samson is a tremendous example of that. But while the Holy Spirit was active then on select and limited people, he was, of course we should also say this, he was always regenerating people and making people born again by faith in the Messiah to come, even in the age or dispensation before the gospel was made known. We're all saved throughout history by the same means. However, he did not work in and gift to individuals and broadly all those believers or the whole community of faith the same power that he would give to certain limited individuals. So we see in Ezekiel 36 verse 27, for example, we see that what God starts doing through the prophets 
is looking forward to a day, he does this with Moses as well, starts telling his people to look forward to a day, await a day when the Holy Spirit will come, not only on a select few, but upon the vast multitude of God's people and have such a universal experience and, and power upon all of them that it will never look the same again. It will change how the people of God relate to God and how the people of God are seen by others. The, in uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27, God is promising the promise of regeneration and spirit infilling that the new covenant will bring first to Israel and then to all those who are engrafted by faith. And he says this, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and be careful to obey my rules. This is the, 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 the one-sided promise of, Jesus, of, of God in the new covenant. He's saying through Ezekiel to these Jews and these Israelites who have constantly fallen away from the commandments of God and constantly uh, rejected the rebukes of the prophets. And here's God saying, you know what's amazing? There's a day coming where I'm not even going to tell you what to do. I'm going to come in to you and then do it within you. I'm going to do the obeying through you. I'm going to bring your will to life, my spirit into your soul, and I will make you walk according to my, my commands. I will give you a whole new heart and I will make you walk according to my statutes. Then the next chapter, Ezekiel 37, maybe you know it, maybe you need to go and read it because it's awesome. The, the prophet sees this whole valley of slain corpses, but they've been in the sun for a while. And, and they've dried out and the maggots have eaten them and the birds have picked up the flesh and all there is is a bunch of helmets, swords and spears and armor on top of these dry bones with no flesh. And God tells the, 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 the prophet to prophesy over the bones, to basically preach to the bones. Tell them I'm bringing them to life. And then through the prophet's command, the Holy Spirit comes in this vision as a wind upon these things. And the bones start to rattle and then get joined by ligaments. And then muscle starts to grow upon the bones. And then cartilage and then skin. But, but then he's still just looking at a whole bunch of fleshy corpses. And again, he commands that the life would come and God infills into every lung and every uh, uh, body that lies there in the valley this breath of life and they stand up a vast army to go and serve God. This was a picture of what God would do through his son. He would unify, he would accomplish, he would give life in a way that the old law and even the prophets could only hope but could not accomplish. And then Joel 2 Joel 2, verse 28 and 29, God again is looking forward to what is called the last days, the last chapter in human history, the last age in God's redemptive plan, and that we know is called the age of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, the empire of Jesus that started his resurrection. He looks forward to that and says, it shall come to pass, God says through Joel, it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, it sounds like the Ezekiel 37 and 36 prophecies. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Not just the prophets, not just the old men prophets. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants. Not just the kings, not just the judges, not just the prophets, not just the priests. All of God's people. Verse 29 says, in those days I will pour out my spirit. So you see that while the spirit was active and present in the old covenant, he still prophesied through the prophets for a later day that would come in Jesus when all the people of God were endowed with an enormous power to serve God in a way that only few were before. And on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus had gone, uh, been ascended back up into heaven, and the Holy Spirit came down upon each of them, Peter then says in divine fulfillment that the day of Pentecost is what Joel had prophesied. So in the day of Pentecost, it, Acts 2 verse 2 tells us, suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared on each of them and rested on each one of them. And all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here are all these people filled with the Spirit and they start glorifying God and praising Him in languages they'd never learned a miracle. And then later on when a couple of 
Calvinists come together and say, these guys are drunk, they shouldn't be having that much fun at church. They come together and they start wondering what's going on. These men must be drunk. Some of you don't like my jokes, but you'll get there. Uh, repent, I'm really funny. And so they said, these men must be drunk. What are they doing speaking these languages? And Paul says, hold your horses. What you are seeing right now is in fact the thing that Joel prophesied. He says, this is that. In verse 16, he says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and then he quotes what we read before, that all flesh, that all God's people, young, old, male, female, of status and of servant status, they'll all be prophesying and in the, and, and, and uh, 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 acting in the, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So all of that to say that when we get to the new covenant and Paul goes preaching around the Gentile world and the gospel of Jesus is preached and understood and the Spirit falls on people and the Spirit enters people at salvation... What they need to understand, what we must understand also, is that the Spirit's arrival upon the people of God to empower each one of us for mission is uniquely the blessing of the new covenant now that Jesus has come and accomplished salvation. The fact that the Spirit fills each of us, not just by giving us new hearts, but that every Christian is expected to be able to live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, be gifted by the Spirit, and serve in the power of the Spirit, the kind of thing that we could really only say was true of the judges, the kings, the prophets, the priests of old. Now I'm saying every single Christian ought to be acting, behaving, and conducting themselves on that status. For you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. This is a unique a blessing and gift of the new covenant, and we should receive it as such an enormous, glorious gift. In other words, the Holy Spirit given to us for the Christian life is an enormous historical anomaly. It was not like this in the old covenant. It was not like this for the average Jew and Hebrew and Israelite. It is like this for every true, born-again, gospel-believing, Jesus-loving Christian. We should receive that as an enormous blessing. Before we start getting into how to live by the Spirit, how to walk by the Spirit, here's what living by the Spirit looks like, we need to understand that the third person of the divine trinity has been sent into our hearts in order to empower us to live the life that Jesus lived and in order to obey the commands that Jesus gives to the glory of the one who loves us and gave himself for us. The Holy Spirit within us. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Verse 6. And this is simply where we get another understanding of the Spirit of God. The salvation that we have in Christ is a Trinitarian salvation. That is that to be a Christian means that you have come into relationship, not just with Jesus, but through Jesus in relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit. It is to say that the gospel which we preach, though it is the gospel of Jesus, and though it's the gospel all about Jesus, it is still the gospel of the triune God. For the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all working together to bring about this awesome and perfect salvation. And Galatians 4 verse 6 is just a Galatian example of this tri uh, triunity at work, and it's just simply so clear in uh, this verse. Verse 6 says, Because you are sons... God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Father, Father, or Abba, Father. So you see, all members of the Trinity are right there in the hat. If you're a modalist, he's changing masks pretty quick right there in that sentence. God, the Father, gives to us the Spirit, who is the Spirit of His Son, and therefore we act like the Son and call God our Father. God the Father sent His Son to die for our sins, to achieve a righteousness for us, to be resurrected in glory, to rule over the kingdom. And then Jesus, in His first act as divine King over the mediation, over the salvation kingdom of the new covenant, sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts. The Father sent the Son who purchased for us the blessing of the Holy Spirit. All of that to say, life in the Holy Spirit we could say, is the blessing that Jesus died to give us. Life in the Holy Spirit is the blessing that Jesus died to procure for us. Because life in the Spirit means all of those benefits that we mentioned before. Conviction of sin, faith in Christ, adoption, 
sanctification, glorification yet to come, perseverance until we die, understanding of the Bible, the power to obey, the willingness to, 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 to continue on in, in, in zeal. All of those things are the blessings that Jesus gives, but they all come by the mediation or the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we could say the Father sent the Son to purchase for us the right to have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the key, the preeminence, the primary, the, the important factor of the Christian life. And we are not nearly as far into this passage as I thought we might be at this point, ladies and gentlemen. We may need to, uh, oh, maybe we have to extend the Galatians sermons. Another sermon, maybe, maybe we do just that. Look at Galatians 5 now. All of this is background. Now Paul says, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He's starting to, and actually look at verse 18 as well. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. That's an absolute statement. If you're the sort of person led by the Spirit, you're not the sort of person under the law. Galatians 4 told us the only people under the law are the bastard sons without an inheritance, are the sons of the slave woman who are not free are the damned, condemned people that have no benefit in Jesus Christ. Galatians 5 told us that if you're under the law, you're severed from Christ. You have no grace. Jesus is of no benefit to you. Need we go on? If you are under the law, in other words, in Paul's mind, you're not saved. So but when Paul's preaching about spirit, and some of these Jewish legalists want to jump up, or these Galatian legalists want to jump up and say, well, I'm not under the spirit, I'm under law. Paul wants them to know, you just confess that you're not saved. Under the law, relating to God through the law, is mutually exclusive, is, is counter, is contradictory to, antithetical to, being under grace and under the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, this is an absolute statement. This is how he's just describing a Christian. Not a Christian's experience, just the reality of a Christian. If you are pulled along by, if you are under the influence, if you are led by the Spirit, if the Spirit is the captain, if the Spirit is the pilot, if the Spirit is the driver of your soul, then you are not under the law. That's not even a decision for you to make. How will I act today? Under the law or under the Spirit? Now, this is an absolute statement. You are either saved and being led by the Spirit, or you are under the law and damned and you need to be saved. Look at verse 25 as well. If we live by the Spirit, Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, if we have life by the Spirit, if we live within and under the Holy Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So he's speaking about two different kinds of things. When when the reason comes to us tonight, you should walk by the Spirit. He's giving us some reasons. And the biggest reason that he's really giving us is because it is who you are. Every commandment that a preacher might make to Christians about living better and being more holy can basically be boiled down to just be who you are. Your sons act like children of God. You're born again. Live like it. You're under the Spirit, so walk with Him. He's not actually telling you what to do so much as He is telling you who you are and what God has already done in you. He's saying... So so the what God has done to us and the objective absolute things that are true about us are found in verse 18. You are led by the Spirit, therefore not under the law. That's That's a promise to you who have faith. You are led by the Holy Spirit. You don't need to wake up tomorrow, say a particular prayer, or hope you haven't screwed up enough Sunday night or over the weekend to hope that the Spirit will keep on leading you. You're in Jesus Christ permanently. He will lead you. He does lead you because you're not under the law. You're in Jesus Christ. You are led by the Spirit. Look down in verse 25. You are alive by the Spirit. The Spirit came upon your dry bones and made you alive. The Spirit came into your soul and gave you the breath of God. You are alive by the Holy Spirit if you have faith in Jesus. So these two things are true of you. And I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what is true about you. You are alive by the Holy Spirit and you are led by the Holy Spirit. That's Paul's primary reasoning or primary logic to then say, so what are you doing? He's leading you. Walk with him. It's pretty easy. He's 
made you alive. So go on, keep in step with him. What are you doing? This is the, this is the logic. The logic, my friends, is very, very, very easy. It's the experience that is very, very, very hard. And that's verse 17. If it was just verse 16 and verse 18, this would be my favorite section of the Bible. It would mean no effort, no sweat, no stress. I kick back. Whiskey on a Sunday night. I'm not going to sin till next week. I make the decision. I will, I will be led by the Holy Spirit. Because here's how it reads. Verse 16. Without verse 17. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Sweet. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Gold. How good is that? Christian life, kick on back, you'll die soon and you get to go to heaven. Verse 17 comes in here as this annoying reality, as this horrible promise, as this assurance of suffering, amen, someone, that tells you just because you're free doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Isn't it the, the fact of any, from a village right up to an empire, as soon as you've established freedom, the enemies come knocking and want to take what you have? You have freedom in Christ, your flesh is not happy about it. Just because you have peace with God according to the law doesn't mean you can have peace with your flesh. Oh, it's going to be hell on earth. But it will be as close as hell, close to hell that you ever have to be. But it will be literally the power of the devil clawing at your soul, which you try and feed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 17 then says, here's the second reason. The first reason you need to walk by the flesh, uh, sorry, reverse that. Rewind it. The first reason you need to walk by the Spirit is because it's who you are. He's made you alive and He is leading you. The second reason you need to walk by the Spirit is because your flesh is a hungry dog. For the desires of your flesh, that is your human nature that is still not entirely perfected, that is your body and the, the base, natural, carnal desires that you have, the lack of self-control, the despising of God's law, the sin nature which has now been dethroned out of dominion in your life, yet still lives within you. That flesh, that sinful nature, it desires things against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit within you are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other, wanting different things, obedience of God, disobedience to God, fulfilling the law through love, breaking the law through hatred and self-love, they are constantly at war within you. Here's why. <laughs> Here's how, this, is, this was God's design. So that you don't do the things you want to do. He just didn't want to make it easy for us. He didn't want us just being able to drift in the Christian life, doing whatever you feel like, doing whatever you want to, cruising through. What, a, what an unrelying life that would be. We would not pray to God in desperation. We would not tear through Scripture looking for promises and power and, su and support from the Lord if, if we were just able to do whatever we wanted to do and there it was probably pleasing to God. You wouldn't even care. God has allowed, until Jesus comes back or takes you to be with Him, He has allowed enough of the dog of your flesh to remain chained up in your life to remain chained up inside your own experience and your own soul so that if you are not actively seeking the desires of the Spirit, if you are not actively killing that dog every day, then you will drift, it will be painful, and you will have to be thrown back by God's discipline and the pricking of conscience back towards holiness. So God didn't want to make this life easy for us. He gets the glory by us having a hard life, a difficult path, but relying on him nonetheless. And you could say, but wouldn't he get more glory out of us sinning less? Let me just remove this flesh. None of us would sin. God would be glorified. It is astounding to realize that that is not the case. God doesn't want the glory that he could get from having perfect, not sinning Christians. He'll get that for all of eternity. He wants the glory now until he sends his son back. He wants the glory that he gets from you and I sinning and him continuing to be seen as a gracious father. Where your sin abounds, God is intentionally fulfilling his own purposes in your life so that he gets to keep on forgiving you and glorifying himself as a gracious savior. 
The more you sin, the more God will be glorified as a gracious forgiver through your life. That's a fact. It's exactly what Paul says in Romans 5. Where your sin abounds, God's grace abounds all the more so. Now, if you think I'm giving you an excuse to go out and sin, you're evidently not born again. This is, if we can bring this to a close now, this is, I'll, I'll leave it with at least, leave, leave, leaving us on that horrible cliffhanger of your life is going to be hard. This is an unending conflict, like, like certain nations in the world, or like the English and the French, or like the medieval uh, 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 crusaders and the Muslims in the Holy Land, or like cyclists and drivers, right? Like a, like a communist and common sense. These things are always at odds with each other. Your spiritual yearnings and your new spiritual nature and the fleshly desires that are still within you, you must be at work in killing them. They are an unending conflict that will never end. They are savagely against one another, and neutrality is never an option. You will shipwreck if you ever try and just cruise. If I can leave us with this, it is the sign of life in a believer to be constantly at war within. It is the sign of life in a believer to be constantly at war within yourself. This does not mean a lack of peace, a lack of knowing God's word or promises. This means that the continual conflict that you think you're lesser of a Christian because it never stops your conflict against the flesh and all its temptations, that is not a sign of your probable degeneracy and not being saved. That is, in fact, a sign of life that you are a child of God. I know that some of you are frustrated with how unholy you are. And you would literally give an arm and a leg if it meant that you could just be rid of a certain addiction, corruption, behavior, stupid mindset, person, relationship, or habit that you have in your life right now. I know that that is your experience, and I want to say to you that that desire, that hatred within, that war within, and that lack of peace, the continual flying of bullets, the continual swinging of blades, flesh against spirit, and spirit against flesh, is just precisely the sign of life that should help you sleep tonight. Corpses don't get fevers. When you're shaking, delirious, overheated, feeling cold, wondering what's going on with you, thank the Lord that you are alive enough to experience a fever. Christians, dead people don't have that inward conflict that you're going through. Corpses don't get fevers when bacteria goes into them. They are as dead and as filthy and as rotten as the bacteria that enters their rotting, clotting bloodstream. But when a living person, when a person alive has a bacterial infection to the blood, then they will be convulsing, then you will be feverish, then your immune system, which is alive and well, will throw you into a fever and a temperature. This Christian who is under conviction and hates your flesh and wishes you could be more holy, that is just precisely the spiritual fever that picks up when you recognize the sin within you. And it's not something you would experience if you were still dead in that grave. The conflict within is a sign of life. And we must take comfort in the fact that he who ripped us up out of that rotten corrupting grave and placed our feet on a rock in Jesus Christ will certainly see us on to heaven. You have his blood-bought promises to assure you of that. You do not need to fear tomorrow, next week, or next year whether or not God will keep on holding you through to the end of the war. He designed this war so that he gets glory for delivering us out of it. It goes against all of his purposes if he loses you. It goes against all of his purposes if sin overwhelms and corrodes you down and removes the spirit and removes your life. But the spirit is able, friends, and you are led by the spirit and you are not under the law and the Holy Spirit is against your flesh and you will not gratify those desires if you walk by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. 
Father God, there are only two types of people. Those who are in the flesh or those who are in the spirit. Those who are damned or those who are righteous. Those who are condemned because of our sin or those who are forgiven of our sin. Lord God, we pray and we ask that those here tonight who have not yet come to the recognition of their own sin and have not thrown themselves on the mercy of Jesus who died for them and rose for them, that you would give to them that faith which only your spirit can give. We ask that you do to them what they may have never wanted to happen to them before right now, and that is that they become willing to receive Jesus Christ by faith and faith alone. We ask that you give them new life. Lord God, we are always also met with this, this dichotomy, this, that we are either saved or we are, we are damned. We, we, we are not saved and under the law. We are not adopted, but also under the flesh. Lord God, if we are your children, then we have your spirit in our hearts. We have your spirit to give us power, and we expect and pray, Lord God, our Father, Abba, Father, please work in us what only the Spirit can do. Make us more holy for your own sake. Make us more aware of the goodness of the gospel and your willingness to forgive us every single day and a thousand times every day. Give to us the willingness not only to repent and confess our sins, but also walk according to the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord God, to hate more and more every single week, every time we read the Bible and come away from it. Help us to hate our flesh more and more and more. And for the idle and the backsliding and the drifting and those who have ceased to care about making grounds in holiness in this life, Lord God, would you rebuke them and remind them who they are in your Son? Would you give them the power they need? Would you make us a church that is joyful in the gospel and that sees victory in and through our lives because you are gracious and you do this work within us. We pray all of these things in the name of the glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.